and then the kids are being baptized. We have special additions this morning. We thought we were only going to have four. We have six this morning that are that are being baptized, and that's not enough. Nice. Um, and so I want to talk to you about baptism. This is probably the warmest ever in the history of Cumberland Community Church that this baptistry has been. Quick pan. Uh, we did a lot of work. They did a lot of work. Ken and and, and uh, Peter did a lot of work, and they heated, put a circulating pump and a heater in, which should have been done 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So, you know, I might throw my notes to one of you preachers in the room here and let you preach, and I'll just be back here on my little floaty. Uh, it's that warm. But we're, uh, we're here today to help you realize that there is no magic in this water. Baptism is not what saves you. What saves you is coming to an understanding that you need Jesus in your life and asking Him to forgive you of your sins. And then again, like I said, baptism is where we follow and we let people know that we've died to our old life and we've been raised to a new life in Christ. Um, you know, they asked Peter in Acts chapter 2, what, what, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent of your sins and then be baptized. Okay? Baptism is not part of salvation. It doesn't get you to heaven or not keep you from going to heaven. The thief on the cross was not baptized, but Jesus said today you'll be with me in paradise. And I want to read a passage of scripture from Romans that talks about the significance of baptism. It's not that it has no significance at all. It has great significance. And if, uh, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 21, going into chapter 6, says, Just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, that means we've asked for forgiveness of our sin and allowed Jesus to be the Lord of our life, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we have died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. So the significance is what's already taken place. Somebody's repented of their sins. They've died to their sins. Sig significant, right? And when they go under the water, it's just a picture of I'm dying to that. I've died to that already. And then raise the newness of life. Going to stand up for Christ from now on in front of people. It's not easy in the world we live in today, is it? It's not. Well, we have a blessing this morning. We have a brother and sister who have both given their lives to Christ recently, and they're going to come, and we're going to let them tell you a little something. Come on, in, guys. Nice stand on your tiptoes. Anybody recognize these two? Come on around, everybody. All right. We got a crowd mom and dad sitting down there. This is Justin and, and oh yeah, Justin and Heather meet with kids. Ashley and Zach. All right. Um, so let me ask you guys, why are you in this water today? It's a nice morning. So talk in there, Zach. Why are you here today? What do you, what do you, what did you do? Did you ask Jesus to forgive you your sins? Yes. And you're following him in baptism because that's what the Bible says we should do, right? Yeah. And you know that baptism doesn't save you, right? Yeah. Okay. And you got a long life ahead of you, so this is the first day for you to stand in front of that many people and tell them, shy as you are, I'm going to live for Jesus, so tell them. I'm going to live for Jesus. Okay, Ashley, why are you here today? Getting baptized because I've asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins, and I decided today was going to be a good day to get baptized. All right. Because you knew the water was going to be warm. Right? <laughs> All right. Well, one at a time, guys. I'm going to have you go down into the water, and when you go under and come back up, you're going to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
come together. We got another one, husband and wife. We've recently given their lives to Christ and living for God. I've been here for just a couple years as part of our church. I'm going to have these two come down. Um, whenever you're ready, hold on to the rails. Be careful. Come on down. Nice morning. You probably recognize them. Oh. I saw a video one time of a kid diving off the end. Um, come up here. This is Bert and Jill Baker. Um, Bert and Jill have come to our church. They have a beautiful little granddaughter down there named Layla that they're they're raising and uh, helping her to understand who Jesus is. So one at a time, I'd like for you guys to tell us why you're in here. Get right up there and go touch it. This whole thing. I'm hurt and. What brought me to come to the community church is that young lady in the front there. She looked at me one Sunday morning, and there was some neighborhood children coming out of their house going to church, and she wanted to go play with them. And I explained to her that, no, they're not coming out to play, they're going to church. The second time that happened, she looked at me with her big brown eyes and said, Happy, when are we going to church? And that was the catalyst to get me back into God's good graces. And we came to come to a community church after going to another church for a period of time. And it, it was just fabulous. From the time I walked in that door, my granddaughter came up and passed along before COVID. It was having the children come up. She walked up and very intimidated by that's the wrong size. But that relationship has since flourished. But that was that was great that she engaged because there were children here that she could associate with. And I sat down and, and for my first time I heard Ron start to preach. I had never never heard the Bible presented in that manner. And I certainly engaged with it. And I was Taking hope by myself, but I haven't turned back. I go to Bible study every week, and it's been the best experience of my life so far. And I'm looking forward to this walk with my Lord. And I certainly have to thank that young lady in the front row there for getting me to turn the knob on the door that doesn't have a knob on the outside because I was. On the inside, asking the Lord, you just come on in. Now you have to open that door. And she did. Yeah. And I agree everything with what he says. <laughs> and this is the best experience you are just being here. I thank you so much. It's amazing to see what God can do even this late in your life, huh? Come on, love you first because you're going to help me with her. All right. Whenever you're ready, sir, down on your back under the water, and you'll be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I stand here today to declare that I do believe these words and I'm proud to become a follower of Christ. Thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
we have one more song to sing, and then we're going to open God's Word and read it. We'll talk about it this morning. Um, I don't know, I'm not as fast as I used to be. One arm doesn't quite work as fast as the other one does anymore. Um, how many of you can identify with everybody that got baptized this morning? At some point in their life, they came to understand they needed Jesus as their Savior, and they asked God, they humbled themselves, and they asked God to forgive them of their sins so that they could become what God wanted them to be. This next song that we're going to sing talks about that. God turns graves into gardens. Doesn't he? He turns graves into gardens. And he takes dead people who are on their way to a hopeless, Christless eternity, and he gives them the opportunity to find salvation in Jesus because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So we're going to sing Graves to Gardens this morning.
public testimony who decided that they needed you in their life at some point, and they've asked you for that, and now they've followed through with baptism. God, we, uh, we know that there's no magic in that, and there's no magic in me. I didn't make the water magic when I got in, and I didn't hold up a lightning rod and say that I was baptizing them. They're baptized because they want to be baptized, just like Jesus was. Nobody forced him. He went out into the water. John said, you should be baptized me, and he said, let it be done. And he went under the water, and he came up, and that's where we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together in picture the first time in the New Testament. God, thank you for those who have gone through this process this morning. I pray that you will bless them and protect them from the attacks of the enemy that are surely going to come their way now that they've taken a stand for you. And Lord, as we move toward the reading of your word and understanding it, I pray that you would bless us and help us to be everything that you want us to be before we leave this place today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as you're sitting down, we're going to have a video that kind of illustrates what we're going to be talking about today. Jesus didn't do the Benny Hinn and push on him and cause him to fall back way far like that, you know. 
you know, that, that kind of stuff. But how do you take something that is that supernatural and make it something that we can understand? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to do that this morning. How about that? Open your Bible, if you would, this morning to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We're in part 12 of this sermon series through the book of Mark. And as we've been looking at this, we've seen that Jesus has been cleansing the moral poison of society. He proved last week, as we were in chapter 4, that he was God over nature. God over anything that exists in this world as he spoke a word and the storm stopped immediately. Immediately with no even rocking in the boat. We uh, saw some disciples who've been with him up to this point who were like, Oh my gosh, who is he? Who is this man? And we established that Jesus is more than a man. He pre-existed as God. He came to this earth, was born as a human being, was God incarnate while he was here on the earth, and helped us understand what it truly means to live for the Father, and help us to truly understand who the Father is. And so as we enter into chapter 5 this morning, i got a couple things I want to share with you. Uh, Satan's best ploy is to help people believe that he and other evil beings do not exist or that they're behind every bush. Some people don't believe in anything that has to do with the power of evil, demons, things like that. Some people, they blame everything. They've got a demon of alcoholism and a demon of pornography and a demon of this and a demon of that and a demon of this and a demon of that. Well, here's the deal. Satan can only be in one place at one time, and demons can only be in one place at one time. How many of you know there are more, more than one person who's addicted to pornography in the world today? How many of you know there are more people that are in one that are addicted to alcohol in the world today? There can't just be a demon of each of those things, but we have evil inside of us that's existed since Adam and Eve broke God's covenant with them and sin entered the world, and it's easy for us to sin, and a lot of times we don't even need any help to sin, do we? Do we? No. Nobody wants to admit that. <laughs> we don't have to have help. We just sin. It's part of us. what we do. And that's why it's so hard as we're in this spiritual battle between the powers of darkness, uh, rulers in high heavenly places, that are there to try to destroy what God's doing among human beings, and our old sin nature that we fight against every day. There's a battle that goes on inside of us every day as we try to decide who we're going to be. Are we going to be the person that God wants us to be? Are we going to live for Him? Or are we going to live for our own whims and wishes and things like that? Well, the devil wants us to see, be seen as a caricature with a red leotard, a pointy tail, and a pitchfork. Isn't that the way the devil's always, always portrayed? Isn't it? Got the angel sitting on their shoulder, and the devil sitting on their shoulder, and the devil always has a little pointy tail and a pitchfork and four horns. The Bible says that Satan was the most beautiful create, uh, creation of God ever. He was called the morning star. Think about that. And the devil never tempts people with ugly stuff. He dangles the thing you want the most right in front of you to your body. Doesn't he? That thing that you cannot resist, that thing that you desire, he'll put it right in front of you to your body. And so... He doesn't want anybody to believe he exists, and he doesn't want to believe anybody to believe he's got power. He wants to portray those who see a demon behind every bush as lunatics. Lunatics that, you know, they're always talking about battling demons, fighting demons, stuff like that. <coughs> they're real. Demons are real. As we saw in that video, that man from Gadara uh, was infested by demons. And some modern scholars have tried to explain that all the way as psychological problems, psychiatric problems, all right? Some of these multiple personality disorder or something like that. The Bible says the man was full of demons. Guess what he was? Full of, demons. full of demons. I don't care what psychology says. I don't care what psychiatry says. Demons exist, but not everybody who's affected in some way in their life is possessed by a demon. A person who's a believer in Christ can never be possessed by a demon. Because once the Holy Spirit involves you, there is no room for the evil of a demon to be there. Now, let me caveat that. They can oppress you. Not possess you, but oppress you. As in, 
give you problems, cause things to happen in your life, affect the people around you, whoever's open to be willing to be able to be infected by that kind of a presence. <clears throat> so Jesus has shown that he's got over physical illness and he's got over the natural phenomenon that he's faced, right? He's healed people. He has stopped the sea from raging and sinking the boat. He's got over everything, isn't he? Has Jesus got over everything? Right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son. Right? All of the same substance and purpose, but united as one. There's only one God. Only one. And Jesus came to show us who the Father is, and he came to introduce us to the Holy Spirit so that we would understand. And now he's going to show that nothing in the spiritual realm is above his pay grade. How about that? There's nothing in the spiritual realm that is above Jesus' pay grade. Now I'll tell you, people in the military, when they get asked questions, a lot of times their answer is, that's above my pay grade. Okay? That's above my pay grade. Has anybody ever answered somebody like that? They asked you something you just didn't have the answer to. That's above my pay grade. What's that mean? Go talk to somebody above me. Nothing is above Jesus' pay grade, so nothing is above him. Right? He is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Creator. He's the one who spoke creation into existence. He made this universe, and he is the God of this world. Okay? And as we think about that, he sat on the throne with God before he came to earth. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that he took off some of his deity and some of his privilege, and he took on human flesh, and he became like us. Do you know why? So that we can understand who God is. And as we saw that video, Jesus didn't say much, did he? He didn't say much. And again, you know, I would rather, if I was doing that video, I'd have done just a little different. Didn't Jesus kind of look a little angry when he got off the boat? A little, look a little, you know. And that guy came, he was going to tear him up. Go tear him up. And he came in front of Jesus, and Jesus just looked at him. And you know, as I think about Jesus on the earth, some people were drawn to him immediately. Other people wanted to be crucified. We look at our world today, what's going on? More people want to just don't believe that there is a Jesus than to acknowledge that there might be. And so as we look at chapter 5 today, uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 20, but we're going to break it up in pieces. The first four verses is what we're going to look at to start with. Extra verse five, or first five verses. And we're going to read it. It says, So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes or the Gatherings, depending on how you want to translate it. Okay? <clears throat> when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. He saw that. As soon as he saw Jesus get out of the boat, he jumped out of that tomb and he ran down the mountain, didn't he? With no concern for his own physical health. <laughs> This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with chains. How many of you watched that video close enough to see the close-up of the shackles with the broken chains on his wrist? Okay? See that? Sometimes we don't pick out the details. And some of you ask me, how can you take a passage of Scripture, Pastor Ron, and get all that you do out of it? I'm always looking for the details. I'm always looking for the details. Now, I'm not a nitpicker. Let me tell you, I'm not a nitpicker. I don't pick out every little thing, but I pick out the things that help us understand why the Bible left the message for it that it left. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as often he was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Man, that's right out of your favorite horror movie, isn't it? That's right out of the favorite one that makes you sit there and pull the covers up over your head just because you think something's coming. And as we see this so far, Jesus hasn't dealt with anything like this. He's fed people. He's met their needs. He's preached to them. He's healed people. He's just been doing all this stuff. And I think, in my own mind, this is my opinion, that this little episode happened so that those boys who had been rowing the boat all the way across the lake who didn't understand who Jesus was when he calmed the storm, they're going to find out who he really is now. How many of you have ever had the lessons from God to show you what he wanted you to know on purpose? Anybody? Yeah. 
Yeah. He'll show you. If you don't believe him, he'll show you. Well, as we look at this and we unpack it, the reality of evil and its consequential destruction, this man who's been in this cave comes running down. He's living in a cave, in a barrel cave. Here's the way they did it back then, if you don't remember. They wrapped the body up in a cloth. They poured a little bit of perfume on it, a couple of oils and things like that, and they stuck it up on a shelf in a cave. I think it was like about four or five days later. A week later. A month later. While the goo was running down off the shelf. And that guy's in there and he's rolling around in it and he's got it all over him and he probably smells like an old dead body. And as we think about that, I don't know that I would want to go up and even talk to that person. How about you? Hmm? But Jesus went to him. Everybody else was scared to death of that guy. Jesus went down. And you know, a lot of times things happen like that in our world. Terry and I <coughs> were privileged to go up with Brad Tracy the other night to a little thing that was going on in Bedford. And we were sitting there on the gazebo listening to this guy trying to pretend that he was every singer from the 80s. <laughs> a couple of songs he did really, really well. When he tried to do the ACDC song, it was awful. Because nobody's got a harsh voice like that, but the guy that sang the ACDC songs. And they only ever wrote three songs, they just put 15 different sets of lyrics to it so it could all be new songs. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, this beautiful little four-year-old girl in a dress with blonde hair comes walking up. She had a little bow right here in her hair. And she just walked up to me and grabbed my beard. <laughs> <laughs> and she gave me the biggest smile that she could give me. And her mom's standing there freaking out, thinking, oh my gosh, what's he going to do? And I said, it's okay, it's okay. And for probably the next 20 minutes, that little girl ran up and down that gazebo, all around. She came up and touched me, say, boo. She came up and touched Terry, say, boo. You know, she would pick some little leaves off the thing and give it to Terry. And we, there was a pencil laying beside me, so we started talking about the pencil and things like that. 20 minutes. And I looked over to Tracy and I said, it's amazing. <coughs> There's a little girl that doesn't know me. Came right up to me. Not afraid at all. Whereas most adults are afraid to approach me. Okay? I don't understand that. I don't know why that works. But when Jesus was standing there, that guy came running to him. And Jesus never, never, he never backed off a second. He never took a step back. He didn't do anything. He stood right there and waited until that guy came up to him. And... He is, uh, after he told the storm, reached the other side of the sea, the encounter straight from a horror story, which we said, and the setting is a cemetery in the dark of night. How many of you like to go to the cemetery in the dark of night? How many of you won't go to the cemetery in the dark of night? There ain't a thing in there to bother you. There are any ground. They're dead. They can't get you. Okay, the bodies may still be there. The soul is either in heaven or hell, whichever destiny they chose while they were on the earth. Aren't you glad that six new part of our family all chose heaven? Hmm? They chose to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> when you do that, all your problems don't go away. As a matter of fact, when you give your life to Christ, it gets worse in your life sometimes. Because the devil doesn't want you to live for Christ. <coughs> Evil doesn't want you to live for Christ. It's against your sin nature to live for Christ. So the battle is battling all the time. Okay, well, do you want to give you a bottle of water, please? Thank you. Um, and as we think about this, it just said Jesus jumped off the boat and the guy came running at him. Have you ever seen two people come into the room in a movie and one starts running at the other one? What do you think is coming next? It's usually not a hug. Right? It's usually something stronger than that. <coughs> and then we see a very scary man with supernatural strength. He comes running at Jesus in verses 2 through 4. And it says in verse 4 that there, there is no man strong enough to subdue him. What does it mean to subdue somebody? Timmy, what's it mean to subdue somebody? Hold him, put him under control, right? Thank you, man. Appreciate that. To put him under restraint or control. 
No man can do that. You know what? No man can forgive your sins either. Believe that? Anybody that grew up in the Catholic Church, that priest couldn't forgive one of your sins, not one. And as we look at this, no man can subdue him. I can't tell you how many times I've been around people who are part of the Pentecostal the division of, 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 of belief system who they grab their Bible and say, we're going to go fight a demon today. Go to charge the gates of hell with a squirt gun. They don't have any idea what's coming. They don't have any idea how strong evil is. Right? Evil was strong enough to make two people who never knew what sin was understand what sin was because they did what evil told them to do. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Right? Evil is what makes... I've read several stories in the last year of this COVID thing where somebody has killed all the rest of their family members. God doesn't orchestrate that. That's from the evil. That's from the devil. Isn't it? People who do people who murder those on purpose. That's from the devil. It's not God. Not at all. No man was strong enough to do him. He was known by the locals to roam the cemetery at night acting weirdly. What did it say? He was howling. What howls? A wolf or a dog? And it said while he was howling, he was cutting himself. I wonder if when he cut himself, he howled, or if he howled because he wanted to, and he cut himself because he wanted to. Don't know. But it's already one of those eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
And there are some who are shackled under the river Euphrates that are going to be let loose when the tribulation hits. And they only have as much power as God gives them or allows them to have. And as we look at this, look at how he addresses Jesus. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now, there is a demon-possessed man announcing for all the world to see that Jesus is God. What was the disciples' question when he called the storm? Who is this man? What did demon just tell him? He's God. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this. What lengths will God go through to help us understand that what we believe is wrong and what we're doing is wrong so that we can come to an understanding of not only who Jesus is, but who God is. As we think about it, he says next, not only why are you here interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, in the name of God, he asks him something. What is it? He says, in the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Now, right there, it tells you the demons believe there's God. Now, have you ever met somebody that says, I believe there's God? Hmm? You ever met anybody? And then you say, are you living for him? No answer. Have you asked him to forgive your sins? No answer. Why don't you go to church if you believe in God? I don't need to go to church to believe in God. I see him at Christmas time. I see him at Easter. Right? It's not enough just to believe there is a God. We must be born again. We must be born of the water, which is when our natural birth happens, and then we're born of the Spirit, which is the day that we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and we turn our lives over to Him. Even though we don't know what that looks like, that's the day we start. Okay? And as we think about that, and we think about this demon who calls Jesus God, and who then says, in the name of God, which is talking about God the Father, he says, don't torture me. Well, think about this. Would Jesus, who never committed sin, ever torture anything or anybody? No, he wouldn't. Because torture is what? Evil. Torture is evil. And as we think about that and we look at it, if this demon was so tough and, and full of himself, why did he just stand up to Jesus and throw his chest out and say, I dare you! Why did he do that? Because he knew. He knew the power of God. And we, who sit in church every Sunday all across this world, do we believe that God is that powerful? Do we believe that God has power? If we did, we'd live like it. And we live out of the victory that God brings to us through the Christ that Jesus paid on the cross. You see, when we're saved, it's God's grace that saves us. There's no works involved. We then do good things because we appreciate the fact that God saved us. As you saw in that video, and as we're going to see here in a little bit, as we get closer to the end of what's going on. Verse 8. Again, we said Jesus has already commanded the Spirit to leave the man. And then in verses 9 through 13, we see deliverance from evil. Listen to what it says. Jesus demanded, what is your name? After he says, come out of that man, you evil spirit. He says, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. Not just a demon, many demons inside this man. Now, we wonder how that happens. How can one entity be inside another entity? Like when we say that when we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Does that mean you have a little door on your heart and you open up the door and you said, I asked Jesus in my heart and I opened the door and I said, now he's living inside my heart. No, it's a metaphor. Okay? But this guy is being affected by more than one demon. He is being possessed maybe all at one time, maybe in chains, chains, we don't know one after the other. 
And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many inside this man. And the evil spirits begged again and again that he not send them to some distant place, which would be to the abyss, where they would have to stay. They wanted to still be able to be in the world. If they weren't going to be able to be in this man, they still want to be able to be in the world. And as we look at this, and I wonder why Jesus would grant that request, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. Think about that. One more verse. So Jesus gave them permission. Do you hear that? Jesus gave them permission to leave that man and go into the pigs. And they infected the pigs, and there were about 2,000 pigs. And when they were infected, the 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Now, as we look at this, mm, they're still resisting Jesus when he says, what's your name? They don't want to go, right? They got a hold on this guy. And then they say, you know what? Don't send us to the abyss. We don't want to go there for all eternity. Just send us into those pigs over there. Now, if you know anything about first century Jews, and you know anything about Jewish life, pigs are anathema. Pigs are the most unclean, filthy thing that you could possibly eat. That's why Jews don't eat ham. And they don't have any idea why they're missing out on bacon. Right? And in Islam, Islam the same way, they don't eat pork. And that would seem to be a dirty animal, but we don't know exactly why the demons wanted to go into the pigs. We do know that if they went into those pigs and fell over and died off the edge of the cliff, then they would be released to do whatever they wanted to do again. Okay? We don't understand if that was part of Israel, which where they were just on the southeast corner of the Sea of Galilee, and that was part of Israel. Why would Jews be tending pigs in the first place? That's showing that they're falling against or falling away from God's law. But we also know that in 726 AD or BC, the Assyrians came in and they took all of the northern tribes of Israel out. And they put people back there that weren't Jews. So I'm sure mixed into the crowd were some Gentiles and some Greeks and things like that. Because they were near an area called the Ten Towns, which we're going to talk about in just a second, um, which is where the man was from. He takes more specific action by asking the name of his presence, and it says Legion. Uh, the demonic presence repeatedly begs not to be banished to the abyss. And then verses 11 through 13, uh, Jesus gave him permission, and we have a demonic presence into a herd of pig, which commits mass suicide. <laughs> mass suicide. Think about that. What Jesus just did affected those people's economy. Didn't he? Those pigs were their cash product. And as we see Jesus doing that, we wonder why would he take away their living? Well, apparently if they, like I said, if they were Jews and they weren't doing what God wanted to, they were breaking God's law. <laughs> they shouldn't have pigs in the first place. But as we see what's going on, that those demons had such a a hold over that whole area because they were in that guy. Now they're in the pigs. Now there's somebody who's a witness and said, Jesus didn't only cast the demons out of that guy, he cast them into the pigs, and the pigs killed themselves. Because they pigs couldn't even stand to have a demon in them. Think about that. Is there just about anything a pig can't stand? Have you ever seen anybody at the fair wash a pig and then get it up and what do they do the first thing they do? Go fall in the mud hole and roll over in again, right? You can put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. You can dress up a pig like a little boy, it's still a pig. Pigs are pigs. The pigs were smart enough not to let those demons be in them. Off the cliff they went. They knew that was the only way that they could get free from it. And so we're seeing miracle after miracle as Jesus is working here. Now as we see this, verses 14 through 17, Jesus' fame spreads. Okay? But it's not the way it's been spreading before because the reception is now mixed. Let's look at verses 14 through 17. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed to see what had happened. The crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. 
He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and then they were all afraid. This guy who was cuckoo, who was doing all this crazy stuff, who's cutting himself, pulling chains apart with his bare hands, smashing the shackles off his wrist, howling and screaming and running around cutting himself, is now sitting there looking like some of you with the clothes on and sitting there being peaceful. Who do you think they're afraid of? The man now? Who are they afraid of now? They're afraid of Jesus. They're afraid of Jesus. Because they've seen power like they've never ever been able to experience before. No man could restrain this guy. Jesus just spoke a couple words to him, and now he's sitting there just the same as anybody else has ever been. That's a miracle, isn't it? That God could take the sea and stop it. And then he could take somebody who was demon-possessed and stop it. Immediately. Immediately. Hmm. Some people are amazed. Some people are disturbed. But either way, they want Jesus gone. They want him gone. Look. It says, Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. I think they wanted him to go away and leave them alone because they didn't want their lives changed. I think they wanted to continue to live like there wasn't a God or do whatever they wanted to do and not have to worry about paying God back for it one day. I think they didn't want Jesus there because they were afraid that they got too close to Jesus their life would change. How many people do we talk to about Christ? They think they know about God, think they're okay, think they're good enough people, and we start talking to them about God, and then they don't want to talk about God anymore because they're just getting a little too close and they don't want to hear it. Hmm? Have you ever had that experience before? Somebody wants to hear about God, but then they really don't want to hear about God because as soon as they start hearing about God, the Holy Spirit starts working in their life and causes them to have to think about who they are. And they would rather stay who they are than to follow Jesus because they don't know what that's going to look like. They're so used to being who they were, they don't want to be who God wants them to be because then you've got to change everything about who you are. But let me tell you what. You don't change. You still look the same. And you're probably still going to act the same. But as the Holy Spirit starts working in your life because you've surrendered your life to Christ, God starts changing you. He starts taking those desires away from you. He makes you into the person that He wants you to be as long as you're willing to do it. He's not going to force it on you. Isn't that amazing? that God will do something like that. Well, this man is sitting there. He's saying everything's looking good. And then in verses 18 through 20, <coughs> we see a change. We see something going on here. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Everybody else is begging Jesus just to go. Get out of here. We don't want you here. And the man who's been set free by the power of God says, Oh my God, can I go with you, Jesus? Think about that. Think about another similar story. Simon the leper's house. Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus over, didn't offer to wash his feet, didn't offer to do anything for him. This woman who's a prostitute in town, everybody knows who she is, comes in, she starts crying, she washes Jesus' feet with her tears, wipes his feet clean with her hair. And everybody said they're saying, Jesus, well, come on, man. If you knew what kind of this was, it proves you're not the Son of God. You're not the Messiah. And he says, her sins are many, and I forgive them all. And she loves me very much. Think about that. <clears throat> when God sets you free, when God gives you his love and his grace and his mercy, and you receive it and it changes your life, you won't be where Jesus is. I just want to be where you are. Lord, wherever you are, I'm going. And that's where this guy is. He wants to go. And as we <coughs> compare the two groups of people, in our world today, how many of you say more would be saying, go away, Jesus, than there are capital of Jesus? How many of you think more saying, go away, Jesus? Do they understand? They don't know. They don't know the power of God. They don't know how God can save them and help them. I call them. I don't know what's going on. Something there today. <coughs> I mean, this guy who's possessed by the demon, 
and set free by Jesus, begged to go with Jesus. And you'd think Jesus say, okay, come on, be one of my followers. But he didn't. Look what he did. Jesus said, no. Go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Here we are on Father's Day. And I think that's God's message to every man who belongs to him. Go home. First, tell your family how much you love them. Then help them understand why you love them. Help them understand what God's done, what He's changed, well, how He's made a difference in your life. And you know what? I think that can change the world. I can change a lot of people's lives if men would start talking about who God is and why they love Him and why it's important and why they've asked Him to forgive them their sins and what He set them free from. But see, we're afraid to let anybody know that we have problems in our lives. We're afraid to let anybody know we've made mistakes. Guess what? There's probably somebody out there who's going through what God already delivered you from, and they need to hear from you how God got you through it so that they might have hope that they might get through what they're going through also. Does that make sense to anybody? We can't keep our mouths shut. This man wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to be right in the middle of a revival while it was going on. Jesus said, no. We're done right now. I want you to go home. Go home. I wonder how long this been since the man's been out. You know, I'm sure his family doesn't particularly want to come and live in the burial caves with him. You think? So he's home, going home. So the man started off to visit the ten towns, the region that began to, and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what he told him. He went from being an evangelist for Satan to being an evangelist for Jesus Christ. He was telling everybody that he met how God had delivered him. And I'm going to tell you what. In places like that, they probably knew who he was when he came into town. Remember where he talked about people who come and look to check it out? I'm sure that from a distance, anybody that lived near there went by just to see what was going on. Remember we talked about that last week, kind of like when you go by a wreck and you go through, and then you turn around and come back so you can go through again. Um, everybody knew who he was. And see, here's the problem. We're afraid because everybody knows who we are, and we don't want to talk about that. Because we might think they could give us an answer better than we could give them. Or they could say, well, how did that happen? And how were you involved in that? And where was God in that? But this man was demon-possessed. He was at the very bottom of life. He was naked. He was running around. He was filthy. He was cutting himself. He was a lunatic from, from everybody else's perspective. And one word from Jesus Christ changed his life forever. And he appreciated it. And he wanted to devote the rest of his life to Jesus. <clears throat> These six people who got baptized this morning, somebody told them, A, you have to admit that you're a sinner. B, you have to believe that Jesus is the only one who can forgive your sin and give you the grace that God offers. And then C, you have to commit your life to God. Do you two know everything about what it means to live for God for the rest of your life without any questions ever being answered from now on? No. How about you two there in the middle, you two youngins? Do you know everything now since your mom and dad helped you understand why you needed Jesus in your life that you're never ever going to have to learn anything more about God? You don't know it. They don't know it. I don't know it. Every day we live for Christ, we learn something. Every day we apply ourselves to what God's Word says, it changes us. And we need to make sure that we are the ones who are saying, Lord, I want to follow you. And sometimes he says, yeah, follow me, but I want you to go there, and I want you to tell them to follow me too. I want you to help them understand that they need me in their life. Well, this man whose life has been changed, he wants to go with his deliverer. He's been delivered, okay? Delivered. And Jesus encourages him to share his testimony among those who could validate it. You know, sometimes people in your family don't validate your testimony because they can't see who you are, they just know who you've been. Anybody ever run into that before? 
God has plans for you. God's plans are good for you. God wants you to be His. God wants other people to see that you're His. God will do whatever He has in your what He has to do in your life to help you to become so much a follower of His that no one can cause you to fall away from Him. And so, as we finish up today. Um, the ten towns that he goes to is the area that was settled by the Greeks. They spoke Greek there, just to the southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Who has Jesus been going to so far? Just the Jews. Now this man, who is a Gentile, is going to go start talking to people about Jesus. That's why God needs everybody where he's planted them to grow. He needs you at the hospital if you work there, at the mechanic shop if you work there, putting in light bulbs and turning <coughs> switches if you work there, riding a backhoe where you work there, building something, working on something, helping somebody with child services, helping somebody with, with uh, getting their needs met if they need social help and things like that. God puts you just where you are so you can reach the people that are there. And as we think about this, we see Satan at work in somebody's life Jesus sets that man free, and then there's a social issue that goes along with it. The economy of those farmers is done. The people in the town don't want him there. And sometimes they miss the big picture because they're focused on things that they believe or don't believe, and they're not willing to change their minds. Have you ever been stuck before in your walk with God? How many of you struggled before you came to Jesus? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. All of us do. But there comes a place in time where God sets us free. There comes a place in time where He delivers us from evil. When we say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I want to live for you. When we see a perfect picture of that in the Gadarene or Gerasene demoniac who was going to come down here and punched Jesus in the face with a rock. And as soon as he saw Jesus, he knew who he was. He fell down before him. And he acknowledged who he was. When's the last time you acknowledged Jesus for who he was? Son of the Most High God. God in my name. God who saves me. God who sets me free. God my deliverer. God, the one who gives me strength from day to day. God, who gets me through today so I can be ready for tomorrow. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because Jesus is with me today. And all i got to ask for is what I need today. Give me today what I need for today, God. And I'll trust you for tomorrow. There's a man who never met Jesus before in his life, had an encounter with Jesus, and his life will change forever. You see, when God really sets somebody free, he sets their mouth free, he sets their heart free, he sets their mind free, and they become his, and they do what he wants. And that's what we ought to be. Every one of us try to do that. And I know you work at it, and I know it's hard. But the reason I think this story is here, we're kind of sometimes like the disciples. We believe in Jesus, but we need help in our belief. Don't we? We believe he's powerful, but when we get a situation going in our life, it's like, then doesn't have no power to fix me or fix my situation. Yes, he does. We just have to surrender. And sometimes like that demoniac who was coming running hard, we just got to fall down in front of Jesus and surrender. Surrender. And let him fix. Let him do what he needs to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the celebration that we had earlier this morning when folks who have made decisions to follow you, they've gone to the place of humbling themselves before you. They've ask you to forgive them of their sins and help them to become the people that you want them to be learn how to live for you. God, we're, we're excited at the range of ages that were in that baptistry this morning. It shows us that there are still parents who are teaching their children what it means to be followers of Christ and it shows us that we're never too old to surrender to you and receive all the good things that you have for us. Father, I pray that if there's somebody in this room today that's been struggling in their walk with you, they just don't think you've got the power to fix the problem. Or they don't, they're not willing to wait until you do. Um, that guy was waiting in that cave, and he didn't even know what he was waiting for, but he, Jesus showed up, and there he was, and he got fixed. God, you can change us, but we have to surrender to you. And you know our name. And Jesus knew the name of that demon. He didn't have to ask. 
But the demon had to bow before Jesus and tell him who he was. And then they begged him not to be cast into the abyss. Father, there are so many people in this world today who think they're good enough. They look at their lives and they say they're not as bad as other people. They make self-judgments that help them determine in their own self-righteousness that what they're doing is not wrong. But your word says that when we live in sin, we're sinners. When we are not living for you, we are sinners. When we do not confess our sins to you, we are sinners. But once we ask you to forgive us, then we become sons and daughters of the Most High God. We don't know anything more about that man who Jesus said, no, you can't come with me right now, but go home. Tell everybody what I've done for you. Tell them how merciful God is. And Lord, that's the message that we need to take the world today. God is merciful. God is kind. But God's also a just God. He requires that anybody that says they belong to him live in such a fashion that it proves that they belong to him. We don't earn God's favor, but because we've received your favor, we live our lives in great appreciation and awe and wonder. And Lord, when we sang that song this morning, Here I Am to Worship, do we really come into your presence and ready to worship you? I thank you for the celebration that we've had today. This ought to be a place where we come to celebrate the great things that you're doing during the week. And Father, I know we've waited a long time to get these baptisms done. But Father, I pray that if there's anybody else that's never followed through or they were baptized as a baby or an infant, that that doesn't count. The Bible doesn't show anywhere that that works. Uh, we believe in believer's baptism, somebody who's chosen to follow you, somebody who's humbled themselves and asked for your forgiveness, and then they're baptized. Father, thank you that we are still doing what you want, that people's lives are still being changed. And Lord, I pray that today will just be the first day of many more days as we find people and we talk to them and you deliver them and we help them to understand what an amazing God you are. In Jesus' name I pray. We have one last song that we're going to sing. It's just a little chorus. Just so stand with us this morning. Hey, we haven't done too bad. We're, we're like almost right on time for where we normally are. Uh, we did a lot this morning. God did a lot this morning.
good news. First one is we got another 1500 bucks as we report our debt retirement, and now it is $2,362. That's from $10,000 five weeks ago. God's amazing. Great. We're celebrating that. We're celebrating that. God is doing some awesome and amazing things. The last one I'm going to go ahead and do for Jen, if you got baby bottle or baby bottle money, to go to the um, shelter. You need to turn it in today or get a hold of her and get turned in like immediately sooner than that. Okay? All right. God bless you. Thanks for staying with us today. I know it's been a long day, but we've had the opportunity to really celebrate who God is.